Good morning, Concord family. Come on, say it back. Good morning. Hallelujah. If you got to be in the house of the Lord, just wave your hand today. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you, Lord God. We honor your name because he's holy. Anybody love him today? Come on, anybody truly love him? Hallelujah. Come on, church, put your hands together like it. Call the response. Listen, hey.
lover. So the love, honey, oh yeah. Church, everybody, everybody say, Lord, I love you. You say, Yeah, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you more than anything. Now, come on, if you really love him right there, act like you love him. Why do you love him? Because he first loved me for who he is. For what he's done in my life, for loving me unconditionally. When I mess up, he still loves me. Hallelujah, thank you for your love. Come on, clap your hands if you know he loves you. Hallelujah. Thank you for your love, God. Thank you for your love. Just lift your hand all over the building today, Lord, and say, Lord, I love you. Come on, you got to mean that. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I love you. For who you are, Lord God, in my life. Thank you, Lord God, for keeping me, for saving me, for healing me, Lord God. Protecting me every single day of my life. Lord, we love you. Hallelujah. Because there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ears. The sweetest name on, on earth. And we say, oh, come on, you really love me. How I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Why? Here we go about it. Sing on. Oh, how? Come on, church, you got it. Everybody sing on.
cannot be without you today, Lord God. Yes, I really love the Lord. And we show our love by praising and worshiping Him every single day of our life. Lord, we lift our name. Lord, we lift your name high. Let your praises rise, Lord, from the inside. Hallelujah. Let praises rise from the inside, from the inside. May you delight from the inside, in the inside of me. Come. From the inside, from the inside of me, Lord, set me on fire. From the inside, from the inside of me. Here's our prayer today, Lord. That's all I Praises rise. Let praises rise. Everybody say from the inside. From the inside. From the inside. From the inside. Of me. Of me. May you delight. May you delight. In the inside. In the inside. In the inside. In the inside. Of me. Tell them to come feel your life. Come. From the inside, from the inside, oh, from the inside, from the inside, set me on fire, set me on fire. Anybody want to be used by him today? From the inside, oh, from the inside, of me. People can say all I want, say it.
one church for you. I hear you. Forgive me. Lift it high. Fall out. What's not pleasing, Lord, take it out of me, Lord. What's hindering me from you, Lord God, take it out of me, Lord. I want more of you in my life, Jesus. I want more of you daily and daily, Lord. Don't be the church. Sing it together. Say, all I want say. Come on, tell them. It's for you. For you to be glorified. You to be lifted high. Come on, at the church, lift our hands and say it. All I want to say is for you. this week. It's for you, Lord. For you to be glory. For you to be, for you to be lifted high. All I want to say, all I want. Take it out of me, Lord, if it's not for you, Lord. For you to be glory. Bless God all over the room together. I want to invite you to a moment right now, if you will, just to bow your head all over this room and begin to ask the Lord to be glorified in your life. Would you make that song your prayer this morning? Come on all over this room today our family that's online, come on, begin to ask the Lord. Lord, I want you to be glorified in my life. I want you to be lifted up. Be lifted up in every decision that I make. Be lifted up in every relationship that I have. Be lifted up in my focus. Be lifted up in my family. Be lifted up in my children. Be lifted up in my friendships. Lord, I want you to be glorified in my life. Come on, pray that right now right now ask him God do it in my life God use me as your instrument wherever you place me use me on my job use me in my family use me in my relationships Lord be glorified in my life come on and ask him for it right now all over right now ask him ask him ask him ask him father we come right now and our prayer is just that Lord, would you, all we want is for you to be glorified in our lives. 
through every aspect of our lives. May people see you. May they see you in how we live. May they see you in how we love. May they see you in how we treat each other. May they see you in how we forgive. May they see you in how we act. May they see you in how we suffer. May they see you in how we live our lives. Father God, set us on fire for you that someone will ask, how can she do it? How can he do it? And we can declare, listen, Jesus is in us. Jesus is for us. God is the strength of my life. Lord, may they know it can't be us. It got to be something else. And it's the God that's in us. Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Lord, glorify yourself through each and every one of us. When we're weary and tired, give us strength. When we need hope, give us encouragement. May the joy of the Lord be our strength. When others are lost, give us wisdom. When others are confused, give us direction. We thank you, Lord. Be glorified in our lives and in our families and in our friendships and in our finances. When others are worried and perplexed by the craziness and the confusion of the world, may you give us a peace that passes all understanding that guards our hearts and minds in you. Father, we say thank you. That it's in you that we live and move and have our being. That it's in you that we can find hope and direction. It's in you. Lord, be glorified in our lives is our prayer today. We thank you and we honor you, O oh God. In Jesus' name we say this prayer. Amen. Come on and bless God again. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. And then will you help me thank God for our praise team, our music ministry, our production team, all the volunteers. Come on, give God a great praise for all the volunteers that make Sunday happen. You may take your seats. We have such an incredible team of volunteers that work every single Sunday. Whether they are in the nursery right now changing diapers. Listen, that's a ministry in and of itself. Whether they are on the parking lot or whether they are greeting you on the way in, we thank God for all of our incredible volunteers and our incredible staff that work hard to offer the ministry that God has allowed us to provide. Listen, family, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Tell your neighbor good morning. Wave at somebody nearby you. You want to make sure we show love today. You ought to feel it in the room. You ought to feel it to our online family. We are so thankful for you on today. As you watch all over the country, even all over the world, we are grateful for you indeed. All right, family, so we're in part two today of Let's Just Live Together. Let's Just Live Together. We, we started last week. This is a two-part series on the, the whole matter of cohabitation, living together. And uh, I pray it encourages you and gives you a biblical framework, really, for how to view this, this matter. Some of you, you haven't, some of you have been married 20, 30, 40 years, and you say, well, Pastor, I'm just here for the, I'm just here to support the church. I'm just here to support so, but listen, all of us are connected to this. Where you got children, grandchildren, brothers and sisters, it's all part of the family, right? So, so it's incredibly important for us to, to lean in as we walk through this together. It was in 2009 that we first issued the Cohabitation Challenge. Crazy, 2009. I think they have one of the pictures of one of our prior weddings that we've offered. 2009, where uh, that was the last one just about three years ago, where we decided we wanted to offer couples that were living together the chance to step in the marriage. And here's what the cohabitation challenge is. It's a 90-day challenge, right, that you go through 10 weeks of counseling where we help you to learn how to communicate, how to manage your money, how to deal with blended family dynamics. We walk you through all 10 weeks of premarital counseling to get you ready. And at the end of that, we offer you an entirely free wedding. We give you a free dress, a free tuxedo, free rings. We get uh, wet reception, wedding cake. We cover all the costs. 
uh, because we want to be a blessing. We want you to work on the relationship. We want to help you get ready for the wedding, all right? So we thank God for, for a generous church that's willing to bless and help us. Here's why we do it. We do it because although the world says cohabitate and living together is the same, we believe that God values marriage. And we want to do whatever we can to help advocate and present a positive picture of what God says. Amen. Isn't that, isn't that a good thing? Don't you, aren't you thankful your church has been involved in this important work? Over these many years, we've married close to 80 couples, and uh, we want you to hear from one of those couples today. Let's hear their story at this time. I have been married before. She, she had never been married, uh, and I had some baggage, quite frankly, uh, from my previous relationship. Um, and then also, um, I had two sons uh, prior to us getting together, and she didn't have any children. And she was very, very adamant that she wanted children. And I really didn't think that that was part of my life plan going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a huge hurdle we were still trying to navigate mm -hmm. um, when she first moved down here and as we, we were living together. Mm -hmm. It was a deal breaker for me, you know. I, I told him early on in our relationship that I wanted to have kids. I came from a very big family. And so I just know that I have so much love to give. And I knew that he had sons already, which would be my bonus children. Um, but to carry a child of my own was very, very important. And so we, that was a hurdle for us. A very, for a while. yeah. Uh, we were living together, trying to navigate what that was gonna look like. Mm -hmm. um, and hadn't come up with a real solid answer <laughs> no. really before before the, the cohabitation challenge was issued. Right. I, I will say I my my first marriage, uh, if, if I could have, I don't know if I could have done it more incorrectly. And uh, really I'd kept um, any other relationship I had at arm's length. I had to learn to be very patient with him while he figured out for himself what he wanted to do. Because I already knew um, that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with him, but he had to come to terms with that as well. We also wanted to make sure that, that this marriage was something that lasted and it was built with God as the head of the house. Just had the, the, uh, the first uh, cohabitation challenge. Uh, Pastor just did it last Sunday. And we remembered what it was like to sit in the, the, the seats. You know, fast forward to going through the courses and it being much more than we ever, ever thought. Um, and then now being on the other side of it and helping people take that same journey, um, our hearts get filled every single time. Six years ago, they went from not only taking the cohabitation challenge, but now they are, they now lead other couples through the whole counseling session. And so it's amazing how God can bring your story to a full completion. Last Sunday, I gave you three myths, and you can listen to last week's message to catch those three. I gave you three ideas around these myths about cohabitation. Today, I want to deal with just one. I want to deal with one, one myth about cohabitation. Here's the myth. Here it is. Living together is viewed by men and women equally. All right? That's the myth. Men and women are, are viewed by men and women equally. Here's the truth. Women view cohabitation or living together as the next step. Men view it as sex. I got to unpack that a bit, but, but, but y'all, you, you'll understand in a few moments. All right, here, here's the myth, right? The myth is simply this, is that when we talk about this whole matter of cohabitation and living together, the myth is that both parties view it the same way. But the truth of the matter is that men and women view this differently, all right? Women, women often view cohabitation and living together as the next step and the progression of a dating relationship. And this is how women view it. View women, uh, by nature of how God has wired them, and we will look at that in just a moment in the Scriptures, by, by nature how God has gifted them, they, they view it as this progression of steps, that, that, that living together is, is, is growing and developing and progressing the relationship, that, it, that it's moving from, from friendship, casual acquaintance, to friends, to, to dating, to now serious. 
And so when a, when a woman thinks about living together, and I, I know I'm making these general statements, there are always exceptions, right? But, but generally speaking, it is, the, it, is the, it is a view that the relationship is making progress and hopefully even progress toward marriage when living together. And this is why women sometimes want to know where the relationship is headed. This is why they may ask questions like, so what are we doing? Where are we going? What are your intentions? What, who am I? Am I just your friend? I'm just your bae? I'm just your girl? I'm just, what, what are we doing? Where is this going? Do you have any intentions? Do you, is, what, what, what is the nature of this? Are we just friends? Are we friends with benefits? Are we just, like, are we, what, what are we, am I a title? Am I just, what, what, women, what, men don't ask those questions. Men, men rarely ask those questions. They try to live in the gray as long as they possibly can. Right? But, but, but women want to know, where, where, what is this? Where are we going? What? Because when they think about cohabitation, living together, they view it as a next step. They view it as a relationship making progress, moving somewhere, moving to a state of moving to a, a different place, right? And this is, this is how God has wired them because one of the things we must understand that for a woman, one of her greatest needs is security. One of, one of a woman's greatest needs is security. When I say security, I, I'm not speaking simply of financial security. I am speaking of emotional security, relational security. For a woman, how God has wired her, that one of her greatest needs and greatest desires is to be in a relationship with a man that loves her, that cares about her, that will protect her, that will serve her, that she can trust in her absence or her presence. She longs for security in a relationship that a man that is committed to her. This is how God is wired, and that's why when you open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, you get to see a man that puts this on display in terms of how he treats the woman that God places in his life. I want you to see this, Genesis chapter 2, and I want to walk you through a few verses in Genesis 2, and I want you to see how this man honors this woman that God has sent into his life. Because I want you to catch this, that, 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 that when a woman is, is navigating through cohabitation, she's viewing it as a next step because she's looking for this man that has this commitment and this connection and will give her this security that she's looking for. Look at Genesis chapter 2. Look down at verse 15. Let me read a couple verses to you. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. I want, to, I want you to catch this. Watch this. And, and, then, and then I want you to keep reading. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For you will eat of it, you will certainly die. Verse, verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Those three verses. Three ideas I want to lift just quickly out of that particular section. Every man has a work to do. Every brother in the room say a work to do. I want you to catch this, that, that when God creates Adam, he creates Adam, text says, puts him in the garden to do this work that God has for him. And, and this is before sin. This is at, at the very creation. It reminds us, it reveals to us that every man, God has put a specific purpose and work on your life. He's put it there. He has ordained it. Not only that, but then there is also a God to obey. Every man say, a God to obey. It's right there in verse 16 that God then gives him instructions and God gives him direction because a man or a woman cannot function without God's instructions for your life. You may go through life, but you cannot achieve the purpose, the plan, and the will unless you are listening to God. It is God talking to you, God directing you that leads you where you're supposed to go. Six, a wheel, he says, there's a, there's a, there is a, a God to obey, there is a work to do, but then the next one is, there is a woman to love. Look at the text, verse 18, and God says, it's not good for the man to be alone, I'll make a helper suitable for him. I want you to catch this, that it is not the man who says to himself, I need this. It is God who looks at him and says, brother, you're not going to make it without her. And then when you read the structure, he says that, that God then, and you keep reading verse 19, and you get down to verse, verses 20, 
So the Lord, 21, the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Watch his, watch his response. And the man said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called the woman. She was taken out of the man. Look at verse 24. And this is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife, and they became, they became one flesh. And Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. I want you to see this picture, that, that when God creates man, he creates him with this gap in his life. And that gap is meant to be filled by this woman. And this woman, when, he, when the woman is created and Adam sees her, Adam goes into poetic words and says, she is bone of my bone. He is so excited about her. He looks at her and he is captivated by her beauty and her intellect and her person. And then the text says, he leaves father and mother and they cleave and they become one flesh. And then it's in that very first section, you get the very first marriage of all time right there. Adam and Eve are then wed, and, and God is the officiant of the wedding ceremony. And he teaches us those three ideas that build healthy marriages, leave, cleave, and receive. He says you got to leave mother and father. That, that ideal of leaving is the idea that marriage is about priority. That nobody in, in a relationship, in a healthy relationship, it, it's not about you having to fit in with everybody else. No, it's about the fact that when God gives you somebody, that person becomes the priority in your life. They become the first one. They become the reliable one. They become the one you trust, the one you depend, the one you are committed to. They become one. Leave, thank you God for mother and father and everybody else. But when you step into this thing, it is rearranging our relationships and they become priority. Priority. He says, you got to leave, but then he says, you got to cleave. And that is the word, literally means, that means to pursue. That healthy marriages are built as each person is pursuing one another, as they are pursuing each other. That you don't, every day you wake up as a husband or wife, you got to wake up saying, I got to pursue that person. I don't get comfortable, but I chase them every single day. And then he says, you got to receive. That real strong relationships, marriage is built about accepting the person. The text says they were both naked and unashamed. It's this ideal of transparency and openness and intimacy. And so he says this is what, this is what women are created for. This is what they long for, this emotional security. And this is what Adam longs for as well. But, but the challenge is this. The challenge is this, right? Um, that unfortunately, the culture has, 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 um, has painted marriage in the wrong light. I, I've, I've done many weddings, and when I do the weddings, I go to the groomsmen, and when I'm in there with the groomsmen, which is typically the groom and the other men, it's like, oh, man, I'm losing my boy. I'm going to never see him again, man. He's crossing over to the other side. This is it, right? I mean, there is this concept, unfortunately, with men that marriage is something you ought to put off as long as possible. But unfortunately, it has been, it is, the culture has taught a man that the goal of life is to get as many women as you possibly can. It is unfortunate that, that, that many men uh, have been taught by the culture since teenagers that, 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 that the goal is to get as many women as you possibly can, that to, to have as many girlfriends as possible, to, 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 that you have every right, that, 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 that there is even some myths in the culture that says that a man was not designed for just one woman. But I want you to understand what Scripture says, that when God creates Adam and Eve, he doesn't create a bunch of Eves. The text says he takes one rib, not a slab of ribs. Because God has only created you for one. But despite what the culture says, despite what the world may say, I want you to understand that when God creates marriage, he defines it for a man and a woman in a lifelong covenant relationship. 
And so I want to say to every man, as you think about, here's the challenge. Oftentimes, what happens with cohabitation and living together is that oftentimes, it's, it's not always the woman that wants to wait. Typically, what happens is that this, it's the man who is still waiting to try to decide, uh, you know, do, should I do it? Uh, should I not do it? And oftentimes, unfortunately, many men will, will settle to the lowest standard, and once they get there, they'll never move. They'll get stuck, and that brother will stay there. He will live with her, and he will, he will love her, and he will, he, will, he, will, he will sleep with her, and he will stay there, but he will never make a commitment. He'll never make commitment. He'll sometimes make promises, but keep putting the promises off. He will sometimes be there and want the benefits of marriage without the commitments of marriage. But I came by to tell you, man, that, that despite what the culture says and despite how society wants to tell that this is what manhood looks like, I came by to remind some brother today that Proverbs 18 and 22 says this, he who finds a wife finds what is good and receives favor from the Lord. I, I came by to tell some brother today, man, marriage is a good thing, man. It's time out for making a way, it's time to look for the one that God has given you. And if he's given it to you, don't miss out on the blessing that he sent you in your life. Marry her, man. That's all I came by to say. Listen, stop dragging your feet. Stop waiting. Stop procrastinating. No, marriage is a good thing. Marriage is a good thing. That unfortunately, as men, we sometimes don't always view it in the way it ought to be viewed. But I came by to help and encourage some brother today to tell you marriage is good for you. That marriage is just like God defined it for Adam. He's also saying it to some man today that marriage is good for you. And I know you got excuses. Well, I'm not quite there yet. And I, I, I'm financially, I'm trying to get myself together. And I, I'm trying to, to get myself ready. And how do I know that she's the one? And how do I do this? Listen, there will always be questions. There will always be uncertainties. But at some point in your life, you got to say, God, I, I didn't see it growing up. Up. I, didn't, I didn't have a model that showed me. I don't know what it means to be a husband. But listen, when you choose to follow Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the same one that saved you, is the same one that will give you everything you need to be the man that God has called you to be, the husband God has called you to be, the father God has called you to be, the man that God has called you to be, the employer that God has called you to be, the God that we serve. He's not a God that just saves you. He's also the God that sustains you and helps you to be all that he's called you to be. He didn't call you to settle. He didn't call you to sleep around. He didn't call you to settle with being the men of your past. No, God is breaking cycles in your life. God is changing your destiny. God is changing your future, and it got to start with you. I'm not trying to beat brothers up. I'm trying to call brothers up because I believe that God is calling us up to a whole new standard. And I believe that it sits and rests with every single one of us. How do I know? I was having a conversation with one brother, and he was telling me when he was thinking about this whole cohabitation challenge, he said, man, ain't nobody married in my family. Mom wasn't married. Aunts and uncles, nobody. He said, ain't nobody. He said, I, he said, I ain't even seen it. He said, I ain't seen it. He said, I can't even point to a, a positive model that I can say that's, that's the model I want to follow. He said, Pastor, this thing for me is all new to me. I, I, he says, I'm, 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 I'm going into foreign territory because I ain't even seen this thing. He said, he said but, but, but for me, the reason I want to step out is because I want to trust God for what he wants to do in my life. And I don't want to give in to what I've seen or give in to that excuse. I want to honor God in this space. And I know there's a brother here today, man, listen, you, God, this is what this series has been about. I just want to call you up to what God wants to do in your life. If there was something by you committing to one woman, that's going to change your life. There is a part of your manhood that cannot be worked out 
until you learn to be responsible and learn to take this step to honor God in this pathway. There's a part of being a man that only shows up when you take this step. You can't have everything figured out before you get married. I mean, you want everything. I mean, you want every answer. You want every question. You want all that figured out. Please get some premarital counseling. But you still ain't going to have every question answered. You still ain't going to know. There, there is no certainty. You can't. You don't know if, if what's going to happen, right? You don't know if infertility's down the road. You don't know if somebody's going to get sick. You don't know how someone's economic potential may turn out good or bad. You don't know if somebody's going to lose their job. You have no idea how it's going to But what you do is you prepare as best you can, and then you get to the point and you say, God, I am trusting you for what you are going to do in our lives, in our future, and I'm putting it in your hands. That's what it—you got to trust God. You can't just try to get all the details working. My wife married me, and I had potential. <laughs> Emphasis on the pole in potential. Emphasis on the pole in potential. She, 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 she saw some stuff, but she, none of us knew anything about what the future held. None of us knew anything about what God was up to. We, we, we were 23 and 24, and we, we, had, we, had, we had faith in God that God was going to do something, but we had no idea what God was up to. We had no idea. We had to trust God that he was going to do something in her life and do something in my life, and by God's grace, he has kept us these 20, almost 24 years. Marriage is not about you having all the stuff. It's about you saying, Lord, I, I, I see you some things there, and I'm going to trust you for what you want to do in our lives. It's not viewed the same. But also when it comes to the women, right? Um, um, women view it as the next step, right? They, they view it as this next step. Um, but women have their struggles with this issue as well. Meet me in John chapter 4, verse 16. John chapter 4, verse 16. I know I'm Looking at several things today, I'm just trying to get to this last perception. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, look down to verse 16. This is Jesus having a conversation with the Samaritan woman. He's talking to this woman, um, and he says to her in verse 16, um, he told her, go call your husband and come back. Verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Um, sis, sis, been, um, <laughs> sis been busy, man. She's been busy. So we got to know we, we often talk about men, right, right? And we know men struggles. They, some men are committed to being uncommitted, right, right, right? And we call men up, but with women, you, you got to be careful too, right? Because for some women, they, they, they view cohabitation living together, right? They, like this, this is, she's had five. So, so apparently she has either been married five times and she's either been divorced or, 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 or they are deceased, right? We don't know. We just know that it's been five, right? She's got a, uh, it's been five, and then, and the one she with. It's in the text. She, she, they ain't married either. She's still shacked up. She, she done had a, a number of men pass through the, uh, the residence, come through the situation. She's, she, she, she has... I've been busy. And, and, so, and so it's, so women, women are as vulnerable as anybody else. And, 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 and if, I, if I take you back to Genesis chapter 3, stay with me now. If I take you back to Genesis chapter 3, around verse 1, right, uh, Genesis 3 verse 1, that a serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? I want you to catch this, right? That, that this woman, Eve, has everything, but when the serpent shows up, he creates this insecurity in her. 
And she ends up giving in to the serpent. And in the many ways, some women cohabitate and live together and, 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 and sometimes do it regularly, right? Because they have this insecurity about where they are. They long for the relationship. And sometimes they are hopeful that he will come around. Sometimes they even think they can fix him. Sometimes they even think they can save him and put him back together again and prop him up and help him get his life back together. And, 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 so, and so women have to be very careful, right, of, of using cohabitation as the tool to build the relationship when the truth of the matter is that if he's, if he's not where God has called you to be, if you can already see the red flags, him moving into you is to not go help Help the red flags go away. If you already know in your heart that this is not headed and trending in the right direction, then save yourself some, some, some heartbreak. Save yourself some, some, some credit issues. Save yourself trying to change locks. Just save yourself now and say, listen, if this ain't trending in our relationship, I would rather be by myself than to be living with somebody that I'm having to take care of you. I'm having to get you up in the morning. And I'm having to make sure you go to work. I'm having to, to support you when instead God has called me to so much more. Women have to be protective because here's the deal. Do you know that domestic abuse is higher in cohabitating relationships? Do you know that the rate of depression for women is higher in cohabitating relationships? Do you know that often women end up taking on the larger financial responsibility? In the, do, do you understand that children are vulnerable in these relationships? About 50% of children live in cohabitating relationships. Or, I mean, 50% of cohabitating households have children. And you've got to make sure that you protect your children. But abuse for children is 20 times higher in cohabitating relationships. That, 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 that these are all dynamics that you as a woman, that women have to be careful about. That you think about this whole cohabitation piece and living together piece. You've got to seek God to honor God in this space to make sure that you don't take these things lightly. What I love about the text that we read in John chapter 4 is that it's Jesus talking to this woman and Jesus tells this woman her relational history. And when Jesus tells her, this woman, her relational history, he's not doing it to make fun of her. He's not doing it to make her feel just guilty. He's doing it to highlight for her how she's been on a search for something and she thought the search she was looking for was the man that would fill all of her needs. But what Jesus is doing is surfacing the, the inadequacy of some relationships because of the adequacy that's found in a a relationship with Jesus Christ and later on Jesus says I am the living water and he says he that thinks of drinks of me will never grow thirsty he says girl listen you've been looking for all you want in him and what you can find is in me and if you find me I can help you find the him but you keep your eyes on me and not the him if you get the him before the me you'll never be satisfied but when you have me he says I will help you to be able to navigate through all of this relational confusion and chaos and waiting on God and sometimes frustrated. He says, find me first. He says, find me first. Find, find, find me first. Friends, I just want you to understand that men and women view this thing differently. Men will sometimes enter it for the sexual intimacy because men have a high need for sex and they will stay there sometimes for the sexual relation. Not that they don't enjoy the friendship and other stuff too, but, but they will stay there for the sexual relationship as well. Women are looking for this progression. But as a sister, you got to guard your heart when it comes to this matter. You got to guard your heart because you got to know that God is doing something in your life, that God is doing a work in your life. I asked a couple of people, they were, they, they've been wrestling through this, and I just believe that God has brought these two messages just to remind you of how God wants to do relationships. That for God, he values marriage, and that living together is not the same thing. That although the world wants to teach us and tell us this is how we ought to do it, we want to know that God says his goal is to move us toward marriage, is to a way that that covenant between him and God is where he wants to take us. 
Friends, I want to close today by allowing you to hear one more story from one other couple in our, in our, in our church that took this cohabitation challenge. Today is the final opportunity to take the 90-day challenge. And I want you to watch their story as I close our sermon today. This is the reality about this whole matter of living together, right? It's incredibly popular. It is something that continues to be on the rise, especially for, for young adults. After the party, I guess the next day, I seen a picture of our mutual friend and uh, Sharnice together. And uh, so I, I seen the at name at the bottom. You know, when you see the at name, you get a contact. So uh, I hopped in the DM <laughs> and then uh, it was on from there. Oh my know? gosh. It's been, it's been great ever since. <laughs> So we lived together for about six or seven months before um, starting the cohabitation challenge and getting married. And we both come from a churchy background. We are both very churchy, very involved in church. Um, and so we knew that we were not supposed to be living together, but we decided, you know, we're grown, we want to do it. And so we went against the grain and did it our own way. And we discussed a lot of different goals and um, different things that we wanted, uh, I guess, growing up for ourselves. And we knew that we wanted a family. So the opportunity presented itself and we just took full advantage of it. You know, of course, like I wanted a really big wedding and we both came from big families. And so um, it was a saving money aspect that was kind of holding us back. And honestly, we were comfortable in our situation where we were. So it wasn't really like a rush to go ahead and get married. We didn't have any kids yet. And I think one thing um, that's really good about the cohabitation challenge um, is that it allowed us to not focus on the wedding because when you get engaged you're focused on the wedding like that's your biggest focus but it allowed us to channel our focus towards our marriage and focus on the tools that we'll need to build a healthy and strong marriage right. um, and then everything with the wedding was already taken care of so that was one less thing that we had to worry about and we were able to focus on the things that really matter everything in the talent try to follow it because like you say, God sees that and the, and the blessings will flow in. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a year, uh, two years, you will start noticing that things are paying off from the things that you did when you followed everything that uh, Concord told you to do in the challenge. And I feel like once you take the step that God um, is leading you towards and you be obedient, things, blessings just come out of nowhere and they just start flowing in your life. And that's exactly what happened for us. Like right when we took that step, doors just started opening. We had no plans to get a house and At in all. the middle of a pandemic right. and literally bought a house, our first home, ended up uh, having a baby. So like none of these things were in our plans, but it's just amazing how once you be obedient to God, he'll just open doors and make ways out of no way. Today is the final opportunity for you to take advantage of the 90-day cohabitation challenge. And so if you're here today and you're living together and you want to take this next step, accept the challenge, I want you to meet me today at noon in the multi-purpose room right around this corner of our building. At, not, at noon today, we'll have a, about a 20, 30-minute meeting to get you through the basic next steps. If you're online and you want to take the challenge, we have a Zoom link in the chat that you can utilize to be able to take this next step. Last Sunday, we, we, we had about 19 couples that are already registered to take the challenge. And so listen, this is your last opportunity. Today is the day. So you got to rearrange some stuff, meet us back here at noon, and let's take this challenge. And listen, it's for everybody. We've married couples in their 70s. We've married couples in their 50s. But they like to say this is a young person situation, but listen, this is for everybody. Listen, y'all know that special friend, amen. So, so, so listen, this, this is, this is for everybody. Listen, that check is, yeah. So, so we want you to know, listen, whatever the case is, listen, we want to help you to step into a place where you are honoring God in your relationship, all right? And so we invite you to meet us at 12 noon today. We can't wait to see what God is going. Can you give God praise in advance? But what God is doing as we step into a place where you are honoring God in your life, in your relationship, in your family. Some of my sisters said, Pastor, I, I like the cohabitation challenge, but Pastor, I need a man. Do you, can you hook, do this man thing? We work all that out. We put all this together. That's what I'm waiting on. I said, listen, we ain't figured that one out yet. We're going to have to figure something out. I don't know, a Concord dating game or something. We're going to have to figure something out. Uh, but in the meanwhile, listen, if you're in that space, we'd love for you to help you take this next step. Listen, let's bow together in a word of prayer. Father, we come together right now 
And we simply thank you, Lord, for your word and for your scriptures. Father, we also thank you for Genesis 2 and 3. We thank you, O oh God, for your call toward men and your call toward women. We thank you, Lord, for the calling and the direction you have on our lives. And we pray, God, that we will seek you in every season and situation in our lives. And so, Father, we just simply want to say we want to honor you. That's all we want to do. Father, whether it's in this issue or whether it's in some other area of our lives, Father, we just want to honor you. That's all. We want to honor you. We want to be in your will. We want to be in your path. We want to be in a space that brings you glory and honor. So, Father, we trust it to you. We surrender it to you right now. I pray for every person under the sound of my voice. As we begin this week, Lord, help us to honor you. As we go our paths, help us to honor you. We thank you and we trust you. In Jesus' name we say this prayer. And everybody said amen, amen, amen. All right, family, a couple of things. The first thing I want to do is invite somebody today that does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And maybe you're in this room today and you've never said yes to Jesus. You've never trusted him to be the Lord and leader of your life. If you're in this room right now and you've never said yes to Jesus, I want to invite you right now to make this decision, to choose to follow Jesus Christ. You can text that number on the screen right now and put accept, and we will follow back up with you to help you take your next step in following Jesus.